Hey everybody and welcome to Chew Stream where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host Bobby Chu and I also have my co-host on here Matt Johnson. If you're catching this live feel free to ask us questions in the chat but make sure that you write the word question in big capital letters so we can spot them easily. Today's guest is the extremely talented Evan Muldmunson. Currently he has a Kickstarter for an illustrated book he's making called Time. Throughout his career as a concept artist and illustrator, Evan has worked on a wide range of projects. However, his first and foremost love will always be creating and telling stories through character art and large illustration works. His past work includes character design on Lord of the Rings Online and Riders of Rohan for Volta Studios, as well as many fantastical projects for clients including Blizzard and Riot Games. You can actually learn from Evan live since he's one of our Schoolism instructors in the upcoming London Schoolism Workshop happening June 3rd and 4th and Copenhagen Schoolism Workshop happening October 14th and 15th. You can get tickets at schoolism.com. And without further ado, here is the wonderful guest, Evan Mulmunson. Please enjoy. So welcome, Evan. Welcome to the stream. Thanks, man. It's good to be back. Awesome. So, of course, we also have our co-host, Matt Johnson, on the stream. Welcome, Matt. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Bobby. Awesome. So why don't we go to uh, the first question. I'll supply the first question. This is kind of like a loaded question. What are you up to <laughs> now, Evan? What's new and exciting in your life? Uh, you know, spring is coming to Copenhagen. That's always nice. Uh, and I have a Kickstarter app, which is really 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 stressful but fun uh, and it's good to have some help on that so you know life's good yeah uh maybe we can just talk a little bit about what the kickstarter is all about why you're doing it what people can kind of get from it yeah um so all last year um sort of once a day i would do um, a sketch and then after a little while I started adding little stories to the sketches and it became like a whole thing where i tried to tie it all into one overarching universe um, and um, so, uh, towards the end of the year my friend Spiridon from uh, from Germany he sort of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and told me in no uncertain terms that this needed to become a book or he would you know be, be quite angry with me mm -hmm. so um, so once once the new year rolled around we, uh, we started looking into ways and means of, of, um, of actually making it into a book and it took a couple of months to do all the little tasks that you have to do uh, but yeah, no, the, fir the first of three now is out, so there will be there will be two more coming down the line. But uh, this is the first one. Wow! I think that being I think that being threatened by your friends is a wonderful reason yeah. to do a project. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Phys physical violence is a wonderful motivator. <laughs> so you know, there's going to be a lot of people asking questions, and uh, definitely want to get to as many as we can. So. I would like to kind of go to Henry's question first. This one's a little tricky, but maybe we can help him answer it. Henry Chen, he asks, can you describe uh, about the perfect training? So what do you kind of, if it was your perfect situation, how would you be training, you know, with art? So I think, I mean, that kind of calls for quantifying learning and studying and stuff because, um, I think it's, 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 it's a very interesting question. Um, first and foremost, the, the ideal um, takeaway from any learning situation is understanding. Um, so it really becomes a question of, of asking the right questions before you get down to learning, right? So if you want to learn anatomy, it's not just learning about how an arm looks, but it's how an arm is constructed and how uh, an arm can be manipulated and how it can be turned into gesture. And it's all about you know, understanding levels of information that you then can reproduce at will for use in your own artwork. So the first part is to really observe the subject that you're really trying to conquer and and look to understand it. Yeah, and, and, and analysis, I think, is, um, is a very underrated tool that people sort of skip over, especially in, in, in course of doing, you know, studies where people essentially copy. Um, a lot of what you ought to do is 
to sit down and, and, and really break down the information that is in whatever reference pictures you have. What's actually going on there? What is the information you were trying to learn anything from? What can be discarded and what should be focused on? I think that you mentioned somewhere that you start your studies with something that you're curious about. Yeah. So curiosity is definitely the, the sort of main tool. It's always um, the vehicle by which you arrive at the correct question. So if I want to study an arm, there are many different aspects of studying an arm. Either I'm studying you know, musculature or I can be studying um, how skin absorbs light and lets light through. You can study a myriad of different aspects, but asking the right one that, that, that only pertains to a small amount of information that is about the size that you can um, sort of appreciate in any given study, that is a technique in upon itself that, that's really handy to get along to. And, or rather, it, it, it's, it's a technique you need to master to effectively study. Now, uh, I would love to stay on the topic of learning a little bit and perhaps talk about uh, the pros and cons of practicing fast sketching, you know, doing the, the oh, this is a speed painting. You know, versus <laughs> the long, the long haul where you're really studying and really like looking at the tiny, tiny, little, tiny bits of everything. Can you mm -hmm. kind of speak about that? Yeah. So I think um, those really just def de um, pertain a little bit to different things. So if you're studying something that's highly analytical, like say um, muscle structure, right? There really isn't a lot of gesture in that unless you're doing um, like a graphical breakdown. So in, in terms of that, you just have to really be patient and just break down and analytically go in and understand that pretty dry and uh, like dry cut information. But if you're doing gestures, for example, then being intuitive comes into it because it's, um, it's a much quicker, much more explosive expression, right? So do, doing quick sketches from highly dynamic references can be super powerful in that sense. Now, I kind of believe that uh, the slow study should come first, you know, because then you can really, uh, you know, like if you, if you draw a car really nice and slow in the beginning, you really look and, and try to understand, and then you draw another car and another car, your hundredth car, and I go, okay, this time you only got five minutes. You're going to mm -hmm. pretty much draw a really beautiful, really quick sketch of a car. You know, but if it was the other way around, if I told you, draw quick sketches of cars, you know, all day long, 100 sketches, and then I go, okay, now do a hardcore drawing of a car. <laughs> so I, I think this, this pertains to two slightly different aspects. Because when you say sketch, you mean draw something from your head, right? Yeah. Okay, so essentially studying is putting information into your head, and sketching and painting and illustrating is taking stuff out of your head, right? So... Uh, when I was talking about like quick um, gesture studies, it's it's essentially you know having um, a tiny snippet of like a dance routine or something, and you just do super quick observational studies of it. But I agree, if you if you want to get quicker at sketching, at taking information out of your head and putting it down on paper, the absolute best way of doing it is slowing the hell down. Because <laughs> if you if you if you if you physically slow in your drawing and you force yourself to to um, visualize and to put things down on paper with with sort of your mind's eye and trying to imagine how it's going to look before you start putting lines there um, mm -hmm. that is a super powerful uh, tool to use awesome that's interesting that leads to another good question here Carlos asks uh, do you think doing quick sketches of my dogs is a good warm-up exercise so not just as a study but as a warm-up do you think sketching quickly works well um, it kind of depends, right? I mean, yeah, I, I, th I think just just so we clarify, what he's essentially talking about is a study and not a sketch, because unless unless he has all that information in his head, that's you know, all, like that that dichotomy is a little confusing. What sometimes. happens but, when you're studying sketches, though? <laughs> like you're doing like a master study? No, I'm just trying to mess with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're the troll. No, but, but, there, but there's a point to that, too. Like, you know, um, I've had days where I've just, you know, sat and been 
been flabbergasted at other people's work, like you know Claire Wendling or Kim Yoon Gi or Kim Il Kwang, and like all these people who have such fantastic line controls and 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 you know mark making abilities. And sometimes you need to sit down and try and figure out not just what they're doing, but why it is so powerful to you. And then you can test your 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 thesis, you know, or your your observation. And say, you know, like they break this down this way. What if I apply that mentality to this other thing? Will that work? Will it not? Uh, and again, it's an exercise of asking questions and then analyzing your own answers. Yeah, I kind of always picture, you know, life drawing or observational drawing, observational sketching as kind of like going to the gym. You know, if you don't have an idea of your routine, you don't have an idea of proper exercises, then. You, you might just be flailing your arms in the gym and you know for an hour and, and nothing really happens you yeah know? No, I remember like way 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 back you kind of like when I was taking a schoolism class I think you once referred to like studying as like like working out like an athlete and hmm. it's a very good it's a very good analogy because you really have to approach it as you're putting your artist self to the side a little bit. You got, you have to abandon the ego a little bit to go and honestly study because the first uh, reflection when you study is, I don't have all the information. And that is a hard thing to say if you're an artist because we like to have all the answers, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a mind, mindset aspect to it too, just being able to take a step back and, and allowing yourself to not have all the answers and, and go looking for them. Whereas which is where curiosity comes into the picture as a tool. Now, I've always known you as being a very positive person. I, I've never seen you upset or anything. Always a big smile on your face. Isabella asks, how do you fight with your negative thoughts? I don't know if you have any, <laughs> Evan, because you're just so positive, which is awesome. Uh, she says, I'm very much a beginner in digital painting, so I wanted a tip. You know, How do you fight your negative thoughts? You must have stunk um, at some point. Oh, dude, I, 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 have, I have quite a few anecdotes. But like, I think my, the one situation that, that kind of pertains to that I learned the most from was uh, when I started high school, I, uh, I met up with, with a guy who now is my best friend, and he was far better than me at drawing at the time. And the thing is, um, that just took the wind out of my sail for like a year because if before then I had no sort of idea of taking drawing seriously. And then suddenly I understood that you could take it seriously, you could learn this stuff. Um, but it was super hard and it was super depressing to just every time I drew something, I would compare it to what he was drawing and be like, oh, this is you know, terrible compared to, to this really, 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 really great artist sitting next to me. Um, and then after a while, we would start hanging out with other people who themselves were better than both of us. And I would notice that Jesper had no problem sit hanging out and not being as good as them. And I just asked him sort of how he went about it. And it was essentially where I got my attitude towards studying, which is, you know, he was just curious. He knew that he was younger and less experienced. And um, all of which is to say that, you know, if you have, if you're struggling with like a mental attitude towards um, any of this, you know, just be honest with yourself about it. it, it there's nothing wrong with feeling intimidated and, like this is a big task, because it is, it's a huge task that you're setting yourself if you want to get into this professionally. Um, but just be aware that everyone else feels exactly that same thing. You are in such good company if you are feeling like it's a grand task that you're trying to accomplish. Well, some people, they, they do think that they're God's gift to art and everything, but well, usually they're yes. not that good. No, I mean, yeah, there's, there's going to be people with sociopathic tendencies anyway. But, you know, th those are also the people who tend not to reach that far. Mm. And then some they, of them they... are. Some of them I've met where it's like, yeah, I think you're awesome. I think, you... and then they're like, yep, I think I'm awesome too, <laughs> <laughs> which is yeah, kind of funny. And, and they also like tend to fall into two categories where they're all, they're in that position comparative to you, right? So they are amazing, you know, just objectively, but in in the group of people they should be comparing themselves to, they're not necessarily the big fish, but they're just, they, they're aware of their position relative to the general marketplace of artists. And then there's the other kind who are just like, well, you know, I am pretty good, but there's more to learn. 
Mm. I, I feel like there's like answer. three different kind of categories. One is that you think that you're awesome, but you're really you're really not, which is scary, you know, dangerous. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other one is that you know that you're not awesome, but you pretend that you are, you mm -hmm. know, which is kind of like comes out as cocky. And then there's the the person is awesome and they know it, you know, and that's confidence almost, you know. So like with the really, really top level artists that I've met where um, where they actually do feel like their art is awesome and it truly kind of is, mm -hmm. it's a different kind of um confidence that comes out you know because it's it's a confidence that comes out in a way where they're not pretending they're just they're not trying to boast but they're just very confident in their abilities yeah and it's it's even like you know a, a lot of people haven't necessarily come to where they are alone right they, they came up with other people they have, have received certain help and stuff like that. so so to a lot of people it's a reflection of the entire journey that brought them there, not necessarily just them sitting there, you know, reflecting on their own brilliance. Mm -hmm. Well, another aspect of that is, you know, it, with these positive and negative thoughts, I think, is motivation. And that's another question one of our audience members asked. Michelle mm -hmm. asked, how do you maintain focus on learning and how do you keep yourself motivated in the long run? That is, I mean... That is the question, isn't it? If, if only yeah. we were Hamlet. But, um, and those are really two very important different questions, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, th I, think, I think, first of all, the realization that there really is no other way of doing this, just, just very simply, like, I know where I want to go. I'm well aware of what my, my dreams are. And having, I mean, being somewhat lazy by nature, you always look for, you know, shortcuts, but again and again and again and again and again, you have it proven to you that those don't really exist. I mean, not, not in any sustainable way. So, you know, taking, taking the Friday night or taking whatever extra time you have and, you know, doing a little. You don't have to run the marathon every day, but you most likely have an hour or two that you can put aside or that you can find or that you can prioritize towards sitting down and doing a little bit and a little bit every day accumulates to a lot you know what Evan you know before uh, I felt like way lazier I, I felt like I had this voice in my head all the time just going oh, I just you know I don't want to paint I want to do this I want to play <laughs> video games I want to lie down and you know and, and just enough times where you just you just notice that voice in your head and you kind of grab it and then you smack it you know tell it to shut up <laughs> tell it to you know go away sit in the corner you do that enough times it stops coming as much it stops <laughs> speaking as much you know as, as, we said to, as we said in the beginning physical intimidation it's a very powerful tool <laughs> no I, I i kind of agree but but again, like that, it, it, it's one of those solutions that have to be maintained. Like you're gonna have to keep slapping your inner um, lazy person yes. because because sometimes a great video game comes out. Like Breath of the Wild came out not super long ago, and I'm not ashamed to say I got myself a Nintendo Switch. I've never bought a Nintendo thing before, but God, that game is good. But now I've come to a point where I'm like, I know that if I keep investing time in this game, it's just because you know now it's just. A, a feel-good thing. There's no more exploring to be done in the game, really. Like, there is, of course. There's tiny little shrines and things to find, but there's no no more narratively meaningful thing I can get out of this. So if I go back to play it, it's purely because I have some lazy me time, you know? Is that what but, you do to it, decompress? Play video games? Uh, sometimes. It depends on the video game. Like, I, I am very picky with, with my video games because it's all it always ends up being like a... Uh, self-reflection thing. If I feel at the end of like a video game session that I haven't gotten anything out of it, I I'm kind of annoyed with myself because then I'm like, why didn't you sit down and read one of like 16 books you have on your list, huh? <laughs> you know, because because it especially when you're a freelancer, your time is your own for better or for worse, which which means you continuously feel very very um, responsible for how you invest that time. So. 
if I sit down to play video games, it needs to be either because I'm, I'm, you know, back in Norway and I'm having like an evening with with uh, my best friend and we sit down and we, you know, we talk video games and play and stuff, or it's like with with um, with when Skyrim was out or Breath of the Wild or these games, it's because I honestly I um, it, f- f- from from sort of an artistic standpoint I admire the world building and so I want to sort of look into how they solve this problem or this problem. Um, and see if there's something to be learned from it. Or at least that's the excuse. And that leads to another great question from one of our viewers. Um, uh, would you say that's a strong source of inspiration for you? And where where else do you find inspiration for your work? I'd say it's a strong... Hmm, I think academically more than anything else, video games is a strong point of inspiration because in terms of writing, there's seldomly much good writing in video games. Um, most of it is sort of empty dialogue or whatever, and the narratives tend to be grand because of visuals and not because of actual narrative content. Um, but in terms of world building, video games have sort of a very nice little advantage in that you can actually interact with the world. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's cool. And I, you know, as as with anyone else, I. I I do have that little dream of making a video game one day, but having worked in video games, I also know the nightmare that would be. So you know, it's a it's a hedge dream at best. Um, but I I don't really rely on video games for inspiration because I um, I don't know I I, f- I find more and better information uh, elsewhere. Well, you read so, a lot about history, you know, and that yeah. definitely influences your art. Like that, would you say that that's one of your biggest inspirations? Is just from reading. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm I'm working my way through this pretty grand tome on like Alexander the Great and his father, for example, these days. And it's and mostly you, fic- it's mostly non-fictional reading. A uh, little bit of both. Like I, I like like the, there are a few good writers who do excellent historical fiction, um, like Con Eagleton and well, Simon Scarr to a lesser degree. But um, and that's really interesting because these people try and get into sort of the minds of these famous historical people and. They take all of the famous actions of them and try to sort of tie them together in one psychological narrative, and that's that. That's interesting at one point. Uh, and on the other hand, you can read actual just history, which is super interesting too. Like, if you if if you read Game of Thrones and you like um, the sort of the intrigue and the politics and the sort of getting to put yourself in the mindset of of a slightly foreign culture, then like read about Philip the Great of Macedon. That is a, oh my god, there's a, it's a lot of purple weddings. Hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. And it's also, it's, it's fun to have as a backdrop that this stuff actually happened. This is our world. This is where we came from. This is what was actually real. You know what? I, I love those stories where it's like, yeah, it almost, it speaks about other stories. You know, it speaks about mm. other histories and things like that. And that also kind of has a similarity to many of the things that I love when it comes to art, you know, where an artist paints something, but it's more than a painting. It's it's responding to another painting that was done like 200 years ago, you know, or uh, taking aspects of somebody else's, you know, ideas, inspiration in some painting and, and uh, kind of continuing it on into your own painting. These conversations in art, I think think are super fascinating as well as you know with stories where you're taking actual facts or somebody else's story and and kind of not copying it but you know you know what I mean like having kind of like a discussion yeah yeah, yeah. you can yeah and yeah and you can I mean most great narratives do try and get some sort of point across like George R. R. Martin like the, the Game of Thrones for example is a anti-war story in its depth right and it plays on so many other um, literary sources. There's so many little like nuggets and little references and things. And if you go and you read that language of it, just the reference language, he puts so many pointers about you know about aspects of social life and about social justice and feminism and all these things, which is very interesting to read if you are into um, analyzing. So, um, do you have like common? Sorry. Do you have like common themes in your paintings and drawings? Like common themes or common uh, symbolism? No, I mean not really. Um, I think 
if if there's any common thread, it's about trying to analyze books in fantasy and seeing how you could build a an actual working universe where if you took sort of underlying structures of our own universe into respect, you could still build something. Like, it's interesting to me to think about how the disappearing powers of, of uh, traditional mythical creatures in Scandinavian mythology and British mythology and Pictish mythology, like, how would that work? What would be behind that? And in the same way, if people actually existed in the same universe as these creatures, and they don't change their behavior, like they behave the way they do in the sagas, how would that work? How would that change human-to-human -human interaction? How would that change how society built itself? You know, because as society moved on from like prehistoric medieval, not prehistoric ancient times up through sort of what we know of history, sagas and, and, and superstitions and stuff like that gets marginalized because we get better at recording things and so we can explain more things. But what if it was real, right? And it's it keeps that same sort of in the periphery point. Um, I think that's interesting. I I, I I like that aspect of fantasy because I feel like it's um, it's an aspect of fantasy that isn't really explored that much. It, J.K. Rowling did a great job of it in Harry Potter, for example, but just not enough of it. Well, let me ask a couple more of our audience questions here. Um, Fernanda asks. How do you get great compositions and colors? She's currently taking Bobby's digital painting class and wants to improve some of those skills. Well, it's the composition course with Nathan Fox. That that's probably the easiest route to understanding composition. But yeah, yeah, I think it's it's always funny when I when I get those sorts of questions because I'm not great at either. I I mean I can, I can compose something and I can do some color. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can compose things in color, but it's definitely not my strength. Um, but I, I keep try and keep it as simple as I can. Essentially, com any complexity in my images comes out of a combination of simple elements. So um, I usually try and deal with values over color and then use color more as, as sort of a, a narrative eyeline more than anything else, like where to drive the, drive the eye. I can, I can emphasize that through use of color, but I'm not very good at planning it beforehand. Well, another person here asked about that. That's a, a related question to that. You said that's not really something you feel is a strong suit or something that you really focus on or you know, is, is something that you're quote-unquote good at, which everybody here seems to agree that you are very good at it for the record. <laughs> Uh, but a question was I, by Crispy Art. I really just want to design characters for a living, but I keep hearing you need to be really good at other stuff too to work in the industry. What do you recommend people get good at? Um, learning, probably. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I think if you want to at this point be just a character designer, um, you're gonna. That's, I mean, because I've, I've been there, too. I, I th There have been times where I was like, the only thing I want to do is just sit and draw my characters. And uh, nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a, a, I'd say it's the better part of concept design. But you are going to come to a point where you want more. Um, so I think, apart from, you know, learning your anatomy and your, your posing and your general design language um, tropes and whatever, um, get good at... Learning and thinking and, and, and understanding the idea behind concept design. Because a lot of what it's become in the later couple of years has been a lot of polishing, a lot of like keeping it pretty. Um, and I think the more powerful um, stuff that I see is people with less polished skills but with clear ideas of what they're trying to put into the concept. Because remember that concept art literally means idea art, so have some cool ideas. And uh, I know that that's kind of vague. So that where where I get my best ideas, I feel, is from from reading and from writing, and from just thinking. Like you gotta sit down and have some some thinking time. Now, if I could kind of add to that, the skill that I would recommend f for people to really think about consciously is is that whole entire idea of putting your your 
mind space in somebody else's perspective and seeing how it would be from their perspective. Now, this sounds super simple, but it's actually kind of difficult for a lot of people. Um, and it can help you in so many different ways. You know, for example, when you're making a painting, you want to, and you want this painting to, you know, this movie is for age, you know, 10 to 16 year olds, then you want to be able to kind of put yourself in that position and look at it from a 10 or 16 year old perspective and see if it clicks, you know, or a uh, client. And the client is saying a bunch of stuff. If you put your mindset into their perspective, then you can kind of understand more of what they're thinking, you know, whether they like you or they're really annoyed of you or whatever, and then you can make adjustments a lot easier. So it's for a lot of really great reasons to, you know, think about kind of like empathy, to think about it from other people's points of view. And that will, you know, if everybody did that, there would probably be no more wars for the most part, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, th I think that's it's, it's a very good point to say just in general to, to people who work I mean because we, we essentially work in the, the service industry and it's very tempting a lot of the time to just you know throw your hands up and say ah oh, my client is a goddamn dumbass and I mean get it sometimes sure but more of the time it's just not I mean communication is not perfect and most likely seeing as most of us come out of artist circles and, and our vocabulary tends towards that uh, and, and clients tend to have other specialties, so they don't necessarily understand that using the term impressionistic to mean less detailed or more simplified, there they can be a bit of a headache for, for artists who then start you know looking at their entire mental library of what impressionism is. Um, but yeah, again, take a step back, try and see it from your client side, try and see it from the other people's side, and if you're still convinced that they're dumbasses, then you know. That, that might be true, but yeah, you, you are essentially rendering a service, so get good at that. Yeah, there was this, I have a really good example of this. One of the first projects I had was working on this, uh, this show for an A-list celebrity, right? And the main character is going to be this A-list celebrity. Or maybe I could, it's supposed to be Tom Hanks, okay? So um, the notes that we got back was like, okay, uh, we want it to feel like Tom, but not look like Tom. Like, okay, interesting. <laughs> and we want the, the, the eyes to kind of like really feel like that intensity of Al Pacino, but it, it, it's not supposed to look like <laughs> Al Pacino. And the, the hair, like so-and-so, but not, you know. And it was just like a lot of times we might get these uh, comments and go, what the heck, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. But if you kind of use that idea of, okay, well, let's try to think about it from that person's point of view and what are they really getting at? And it's really like the posture, the mannerisms, you know, that they were really looking for. That's how it would feel like the person but not look like the person. Another viewer question here. Um, Sweet Pigment asked, do you think seeing mistakes after you finish a drawing a good or a bad thing? Or immediately oh. seeing your mistakes after you finish something? I mean, as frustrating as it is, it's first of all, it's just it doesn't really matter if it's good or bad. It, it's going to happen. You're going to be the first and best critic for yourself. But um, I think taking some time away from your work once you've, you've decided to be done with it, is a better thing because it's hard to determine for yourself whether or not what you're seeing is your uncertainty or your criticism. And so, you know, leave your stuff alone for a week. Put it, put it in a box, put it on the online, and just leave it alone and then come back to it and try and be objective in your analysis. You'll get a lot more out of it and you'll get a much better uh, criticism of yourself. And I had a... Great. I had the next question, if that's okay. Um, you know, you did, for your Kickstarter, the the, the Tyne uh, book, it's filled with all this stuff that you did on a daily basis. You did these daily, you know, drawings, illustrations, sketches. Uh, did you work on, like, I'm just wondering, how did that work? Because some days I don't have any good ideas. You know, that's why I have like a little sketch kind of journal thing where I sketch in ideas. Do you do that? Do you work on multiple pieces? How does it work? Um, I was kind of hit and miss sometimes. Um, 
I think I, I got into this rhythm of doing like three, four, five days of mm -hmm. one little storyline and then skipping to another one. Um, so a lot of the reason for that was that was it was almost impossible to keep coming up with ideas for the same characters in the same story arc again and again and again and again. So I could I could think of a couple of little story beats that I could do, um, and then I would sort of nail that down um, into se sets of five or four or whatever. Um, and then once I had done that, I could just freely jump to another one and another one. And they were all based on um, slightly different sets of, of references. So if I was stumped for something to do, I could just go and read and, and find a new thing that I found interesting. For example, like Ayan, the little the female warrior, um, she's based a lot on, um, on reading about this... She's like the grand niece or something of Genghis Khan, uh, and just this in incredibly forceful person in a in a man's world. She worked her way up and became this like terror of all the men around her. <laughs> um, and it's just it's interesting to yeah, and it's it's super inter interesting because uh, like people, it, she's essentially Brienne of Tarth without the the the, the sort of self confidence issues, and it's. It's weird that that person existed in the real world, but far weirder that she she just she left such an impact on the entire f female positioning in that subculture of the Mongols for such a long time. So like that that was one. Or for Birker, it was just every trope I could think of of like the Norwegian dwarfs uh, like Nisid, um, and for like the Vikings, um, I actually. I read about these guys, the Varangian Guard, which were these Vikings who went down to Constantinople and took the hire of like the Byzantine emperors, and they had like tons of crazy adventures. So it just became this thing of, of reading for inspiration and then going around and thinking about it a lot. And uh, but it was definitely like an ongoing process. It, it was never just something that popped into the head. So it's like one Alex drawing asked. at a time, though. Yeah. Okay. That's great. This is kind of a, a related uh, question here. Alex asks, how do you manage your time to create such great work each week? Um, as best as I can. So the, these last sort of six months, or the five months since, um, since New Year, I've taken it a little easier. Uh, I haven't posted as much. I've taken on a little more freelance work and just tried to sort of cool off a little bit uh, and accumulate more ideas so that I have a little bit of a, a backlog of things that I want to draw, essentially just so I can sort of tease myself back into being excited about it. Um, but it's it's about creative, creating like a mental backdrop for every other aspect of your life so that whenever I'm not doing this, whenever I'm not sitting down and drawing or thinking up ideas and stuff, I kind of have to justify it to myself. Um, some things, of course, you don't like. If you if you're making food, that's you know that's a perfectly respectable investment of time. But um, or if I'm working out, you know, I, I know that I can I can justify that. But if I if I want to go out uh, on the town, or if I um, if I want to take uh, a weekend off and just go and explore my city or something, I kind of have to take a moment and think like, okay, have I drawn enough this week? Do I feel like I've earned this? Um, and I can understand that, that it, would, it would sound to me, if I was not inside of my head at the moment, that that would soon lead me to like resent drawing. Um, but then I have the process. I have the process of, you know, the, there are so many little things that I want to express, and there's so many little things that I want to play with and figure out, and uh, that I want to make my own versions of. Like, um, when I was little, for example, um, I learned how to draw goblins by looking at, like, Paul Bonner and Paul Dainton. Um, and at some point, actually, like two years ago, I guess, year and a half, when I was at THU, uh, and I showed my sketchbook to some people, and one of them said, like, he loved everything, but I needed to learn how to draw orcs and goblins, my own orcs and goblins, because I was drawing other people's orcs and goblins. And so that, that has kind of stuck with me. Like, yeah, there are a bunch of my stuff that's just essentially... Um, you know, whole hog derived from other sources. So I'm trying to go back and like figure out like what is a goblin? What, what, like where does the idea come from? What are they? How can you make another version of them that's still interesting but not 
totally derived from another artist's impression of the same concept. And the same for orcs, the same for hog goblins, and all these kinds of things. So, like, the, my version of wood elves, for example, was a very direct idea of, like, elves use magical powers to manipulate things. Why wouldn't they just try and become one with whatever they're living in instead of trying to manipulate it like Tolkien elves would do? It's just these mm. kinds of ideas instead. Now, a lot of your posts, they, they seem very, you know, quick and, and pretty much most of them are digital. When, you know, I was looking on your Kickstarter, you are offering a uh, drawing and a sketch mm -hmm. uh, in different packages. Yep. You know, it, it, a lot of times it kind of sounds like a little fuzzy on the details of what's the difference between a sketch and a drawing? You know, how long do you take on these things? Can you elaborate? Yeah, like a, a sketch would be like a signatory sketch, like some, something I would, um, if I was doing like a book signing, I would sit down and do in, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and a drawing would be something quite more elaborate. We're talking a couple of hours, like a fully in, f fully finished, like, um, realized drawing. Like 20 characters or more, like that kind of thing. <laughs> probably, <laughs> not, probably not that, <laughs> but, but, you know, like, um, I tried, guys. More, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you and your traps. No, but probably more along the lines of what I've been posting as like a, a finished drawing, something that takes a little while and has a little more thought put into it and a little more effort, essentially. I have a couple of questions here. Bobby, a quick question for you. Can you pay with PayPal for the monthly subscriptions on Schoolism? Uh, no. So the reason why is because in the very beginning, um, PayPal, their their subscription kind of module or whatever didn't have the functionality that we wanted. Uh, now they have a new company that they acquired called Braintree, which supposedly can do that stuff. But it's you know we would have to look into the API and you know really kind of study a whole new language. So. Um, Hopefully in the future, it's something that we are definitely talking about and it's on our list every time we talk, uh, have our meetings and such. So hopefully in the future, but right now, yeah, it's with Stripe. And um, the, the issue with that is that with PayPal, you have money that is with PayPal. So when you go and you buy something, it's pretty much guaranteed to go through. When you're going from a credit card to the vendor, then the credit card goes through the bank and banks are very nervous kind of people so um, it can be a little bit more difficult and really what you need to do is if you're having trouble is call your credit card and uh, make sure that that the payment is okayed you know and then you should be fine Good deal. Uh, a couple of people have oh, asked. Oh, and we sorry, have, uh, uh, if I may, I just wanted to mention that we only have two sales a year, right? And right now is our spring sale. It's happening for about a month where you save 33% on all Schoolism subscriptions. You can get it for not $15 a month, but $10 a month for a, a whole uh, six months. Your first six months would be ten dollars a month instead of fifteen if you use the discount code bloom you know b-l-o-o-m as in like flowers blooming and uh you type that in before you purchase you know where it says discount code you type that in and you'll get the savings so no more excuses if you thought oh, fifteen dollars too much for education from like you know world-class professionals now it's ten bucks so you know <laughs> I think there's skip, not that many skip excuses. one skip one coffee skip one coffee and you can have some good education yeah. You're good man I don't have any more money I guys. bought this Nintendo switch I need to get five more <laughs> games you know like oh, no. ten dollars oh, no. but so you much. bought Nintendo for the inspiration <laughs> you wanted to be inspired so it's a good investment now um, I was gonna also just real quick add to that like I'm just so glad that subscription model exists because I mean you know the class costs used to have to be so high and now you can take these classes for a netflix subscription basically it's just it's great thanks matt um yeah a couple of questions here uh, these kind of go in line a couple of people have asked for portfolio advice so 
Real quick, Evan, could you give maybe any portfolio advice you'd have for people coming out of school or looking for jobs and internships? Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so I do portfolio reviews pretty much every um, workshop I go to. So what tends to be the meme is people have a lot of stuff in their portfolio. We're talking, you know, 20, 25, 30 pages of stuff. Um, and while it tends to be a lot of good stuff, it can clog up the message. Essentially what you want your portfolio to be is, hello, this is me, this is what I can do for you, and here are the things that I like to do. That should be your structure, essentially. Um, so having one general portfolio for, for every client might be not great. You might want to sort of specialize for, for different clients depending on, on what their um, needs are. But the general gist of it should be that this is a document that shows the the uh, prospective client what you can do for them and um, the ways in which you can do it. You know, I kind of think of it as kind of like uh, the general portfolio is like a pickup line. It's a general line that you say to try to achieve something. But, you know, sometimes it works. You just got to ask enough people, I guess. But if you kind of look at the person and you go, oh, that person likes these kind of things, right? Or that company, they're into these kind of things. And I will cater my line, my portfolio to, to that person, to that company. You're going to get a way better success rate. Absolutely. And, and I think also one like, time... Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, just just also be uh, be aware of your own worth a little bit. Like, don't don't price yourself out of the market. But you don't have to shotgun to everyone, and you do not have to bend yourself to everyone. There are a lot of clients out there, and um, being a little bit choosy yourself about where you go and where you invest your energy can also save you a lot of um, essentially a lot of uh, rejection that's super interesting because it's like you know i'm sure we can all three of us we can think of people that if they were a little bit more choosy they would actually get probably paid more and become more successful and then there's also oh. you can get too choosy where you know you can kind of picture somebody yeah that person oh, so hard to deal with <laughs> if they were less choosy they would probably do a lot better you know so there's that balance Oh, definitely. Um, and yeah, again, like try, try, try and figure that balance out um, a little bit through trial and error. And, you know, humility is, is, is good. Um, and a little bit of cynicism on top of that can be a powerful and, and, and very useful combination. But I see way too many um, incredibly, um, just, just not, not even like promising, but well-rounded, artists who could probably do their own thing uh, and make good money or at least score a job far better than where they are at the moment. Um, but mostly because we, all of us, are real happy whenever we get to have a job that lets us draw things for a living. Um, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable to, to rock that boat. Yeah, especially if you're depending, you know, if you're in a country where you're really depending on the health care that the union provides mm -hmm. you or you know that company is providing you and you have a family you have kids then it gets really you know you really have to take that leap of faith almost but that that is how society has kind of i feel consciously structured it that way <laughs> to keep us in line you know it's up to us it's, to, it's, to break through. It's fascinating, like be, being from from Europe for one point, but being from Scandinavia, the communist of Europe. Um, it's interesting to to talk to people from the Americas about these things because that's not really a consideration we have to take into in, in into our minds when we uh, when we think about those kinds of things. It's you know, mm -hmm. can can I pay my taxes on time? Because they're pretty high over here, but. Yeah, like the the general build of of society here is is that it's slightly, seemingly, more difficult to be a um, uh, be, being be a creator from the ground up. However, the potential downside is so much less than that. It's a lot less scary as well. You know, uh, 
I want to go to Razor Cheeks' question for you, Evan. Uh, do you think you're Do you think you're good now? Do you or do you think you're still not very good? You know, some people like their art, some people don't. Does that feeling of insecurity ever go away? Um, I think it just morphs. At this point, it's not really a question of good or bad. I'm aware of a lot of artists who do what I do better than I, how I do it. I'm aware that I've gotten to a point where there's enough objective evidence to, that I can't... And I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's self-indulgent at this point for me to go, oh, I'm so horrible at this, you know? Um, and I, I, I know I'm not bad, but I also know that there's a lot left, left to learn. So I don't really look at it as a, as a thing of good or bad. It's, it's more about, like, what's next. Mm. So what is next? Um, comp- I mean, the, the, the next big challenge is to get good at color. Like, how, g- getting an, an understanding of color that's um, more as a, a tool rather than a task. Because at this point, I've, I've, my understanding and, and, and sort of use of color is, is more to, to add something to a painting that I feel is necessary for the painting to have life, but it's more of a task still than a tool. Uh, and I, w- I want to get to a point where I can, I can sort of have an appreciation for it deeper than what I have now, which is, I mean, um, the guy I, I share a studio with, Jesper Eising, he is one of those people who can, who, he, he can think in color, he can think in understanding of color. So having his work around the studio and being able to look at it, as, uh, that's a good inspiration. Great. This uh, leads to a good question here. Uh, Carrot Katana asks, "How does Evan learn something? Sometimes they, sometimes I lose sight of what I'm looking to know when I begin, since there's so much to learn. How do you break it down and focus when you set out to learn something?" Feels like she kind of answered her, her own question there. Um, <laughs> that, that that you just you have to keep your eye on the ball. You have to single out exactly what it is you're wanting to learn from this exercise that you're doing and then focus on that. Because, again, like we, you hear the term study banded around a lot, especially when people post, you know, um, lovely copies that they've done of things and they say it's a study. Well, okay, what have you studied then? What, can you, what have you learned? What have you taken away? What can you deploy as a new resource in, in the next sketch you do? Studying is about information gathering as much as anything else. So, um, again, it's, it's, it's the task of asking the right question and then figuring out ways of answering that question in ways that gives some sort of elegance or some sort of understanding to the viewer. Very good. Great. Uh, I think I'm losing you guys. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll take over. Uh, you know, I have a question from AJ uh, Keller. AJ Keller asks, when you work, do you try to include narratives into your subject matter? This one's a quick one. I'm just going to say it for you, Evan. Yeah. <laughs> he has a story as well. If you check out his uh, Instagram um, or better yet, his Kickstarter, his Kickstarter book is full of all the wonderful uh, stories and narratives that Evan has been locked locking in his head and has graciously shared with the world so get on his kickstarter you could look for uh evan's uh kickstarter well you could probably just type in evan's name and kickstarter and you'll find it it's called ting ten ting Tine. <laughs> Tine. <laughs> <laughs> i knew i was getting it wrong but oh geez well i could i could add a little something to that question personally just a personal curiosity um how do you feel like you can infuse a single image with narrative where you write these little passages that accompany an image? How does that work as sort of a secondary piece of the art that you've created? Yeah, or, or even like what like comes first? Poems. Does the story yeah, come yeah. first or does the image come first? I almost feel like the story comes second. They yeah. co- well, I mean, the, the, the concept comes first, which is kind of the point. Um, because this has always been kind of like a mental exercise that went on whenever I was drawing. Um, 
that you, I mean, and you probably had it too. Like when you you start drawing something, you start drawing a creature or a character or something, and you start fig- like trying to think like who is this person? What do they do? How do they prefer to have their coffee? You know, like all these little banal questions that it's almost impossible to answer in in a drawing, but you can hint at it. And then if other people ask the same question in their mind, there is a solution within the drawing. Um, and so when I started doing this whole thing, uh, it became an, an exercise in like how, how deep can you go with it? How many little steps can you take down that rabbit hole without losing that initial idea of the sketch? I almost feel like, uh, well, maybe because I'm an artist, I feel like if I start from the general idea and I do the painting or the sketch and then I write the little story out, that that tends to go the best for me, like with that process. Mm. Is that the kind yeah, of I same? Mean, the, yeah, the wording tended to come last in as much as, you know, like that I would usually write that um, at the very end. But as I was drawing, I would try and come up with uh, little descriptions and little just the little general combinations idea. of words. Yeah, little just just little combinations of words and little sentences that I found, you know, added something that gave me just a good feeling, you know. So especially when I was drawing toward towards the end, um, I was kind of building towards something, um, and it all became this thing of like, how can you, just through relationships of people and and, and creatures in an image, can you show something about how that world works? Mm. Um. I want to go to a quick question for me from Matthew Smith. He asks, uh, Bobby, what do you feel like you're learning most from the Taco House class? Because I was saying in previous streams that I'm taking, currently I'm taking the painting in Color and Light with Dyson Robert, Dyson Tsumi, Robert Kondo, the founders of Taco House. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's super awesome. So the thing that I'm learning the most is starting from color. Right. And, and very much what Evan was saying, how do we, I think both Evan and I, I'm sure you would probably agree, are more drawers than painters in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, so we think very linearly uh, and something very close to that is tone, value. Right. So then both of us, I feel like, uh, started with the value aspect of things and approaching things with, you know, shadow, light, grayscale that kind of stuff. Right, Evan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah and, very much so. And so uh, the Tonko House class takes it from a different approach where you're approaching it, you're, you're developing paintings a lot faster straight into color. Even though you do black and white studies as well, that's, that's what you're going to get from the class. And the really great things that I've been getting from the class is the different approach, which helps to kind of stretch my potential and stretch my, my efforts in making these uh, paintings, but as well is learning the different aspects of uh, color and how it's manipulated, how, how artists that really paint through thinking in color uh, add a different level than just starting thinking in value. Mm. Yeah, sorry. I, I have their I have their book um, from um, the Dam Keeper on my um, on my bookshelf, and it it comes down a lot these days when I'm just I'm stumped for something, and I just I need to look at something that just gives me like a happy fluttery feeling in my in my stomach. Yeah. Oh, that book is that book is amazing. And the the coolest thing about that that uh, film is that every frame it was painted, but it all is very cohesive, even though many different types of people painted uh, those backgrounds, those frames, right? Mm -hmm. So how did they do it? Well, because Dice and Robert taught them how to paint like them. And through that experience of making the Dam Keeper is how they came up with this uh, method of teaching people in their class, you know? So it's tried and true. It's a very much tested, kind of uh, curriculum and it works mm-hmm. so uh, almost out of time here why don't we go to a couple more questions Matt you want to pick one 
Yeah, um, a couple of them that have a common thread here are good, so I'm going to try to do that for you guys so that we get as many people's curiosities answered as we can. Um, do you guys have, this is for Evan and Bobby, do you guys have a daily activity that you think is just invaluable to your practice, just something that, that really is important to you to do every day to get better? Ah, sleeping. <laughs> um, no, I mean... That that's a little bit stupid, but um, I, I I kid you not though. Like a lot of the processing that is so necessary for studying to have any any effect at all happens in those like ten minutes when I'm lying down in bed and just powering down, and all of the lessons start like just seeping in. And the the, the problem the problem with that is when you've had a really good study day, it's almost impossible to go to bed because you start like you start having like cool ideas based on something you learned from an interesting study and then you have to get up and find your sketchbook and doodle something down and you know just write something or maybe there's like a, a solution and, and a combination of shapes that comes to you and you just have to get up and and you know doodle something quick i had that um recently actually when i was in, uh, in kuala lumpur and i was going to bed and i'd been looking at pictures and like just doodling little pictures of of pigs all day and suddenly it was just this realization that, oh, pigs are great subjects for, like, work concepting. So I just, like, got out of bed and I just had to like, do, like, three, four ideas for, like, pig-based orcs. <laughs> and, then you can, and then you can go to bed afterwards. You know, on, on that note, uh, I've read before, or I think I read before, I'm pretty sure this is a fact and it's not a Bobby Chu fact, um, that Vincent <laughs> van Gogh, he would have something on his head a little rock or something like that and and he just tries to stay up and then when he starts nodding off he has a plate in front of him so that the rock would fall off his head hit the plate wake him up and he'd start drawing whatever was in his mind at that time with just between consciousness and you know sleep which i thought was yeah. super fascinating that's, uh, that's Salvador Dali, actually. Um, okay, there you I, go. I, I, it was kind of a Bobby Chu fact, so thank you very much for uh, <laughs> helping me correct that. See, I wasn't sure, so I wanted to mention I wasn't sure. Um, but that, that, that story is really funny, too, because he started figuring out that the only way he could get more interesting um, in, in like his subject matter was to take the stuff that was purely out of his, you know, admittedly somewhat crazy mind, so he couldn't... He couldn't process. He needed like the direct access, and the best best access was his dreams. <laughs> That's super cool. You know, for me, my the number one practice for me is just because I have so many things to do. I need to schedule. So there's my to do list. There's my calendar. I need to get to those every single day or else things will fall apart very quickly. And for me, that's because I have so many things to do. So. And that leads to one good question about scheduling. Uh, you talk about planning your days in advance. Uh, Lewis asks, uh, you talk about planning your days in advance and was wondering, do you plan a strict timetable or do you keep it vague and only kind of outline key points that you'd like to explore? I keep it very strict on the things that I should do, but the timeline, I keep it more... Uh, I, I make room for you know, wiggle room, you know, say you have to go out and you just got to get something real quick, things like that. So if I need to do something for an hour and I think that there might, I need some wiggle room, I'll make it for an hour and a half. But what I need to do in that hour is very precise. That way you don't have to think about any of the details. They're all plotted out for you and you could just get to work. I found that to be super, super helpful, especially when taking you know, uh, online classes, um, because I have other things that I need to do that are quote unquote more important because they pay the bills. Right. So fitting that stuff in it, schedule mm -hmm. is important. Anyways, Evan, how does it work? what's that? Hmm? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to speak over you, Bobby. No, it's fine. What are you going to say? I was just going to ask Evan, what about your schedule? How do you schedule things in the day? Um, my rule of thumb is just to be harsh on myself and like, what do I need to have done today? Um, and then I, I may make an estimation of um, how long will that take? How much time do I need to get this done? And then how much time do I potentially need for like wiggle room and, and, and possibly to add on? And like, what, what, could, what could make this process slower? 
Um, but also because uh, I go around to like a bunch of workshops and stuff these days, it's hard to have a very specific work schedule. Um, so it's it's also like a week schedule thing where I know, I I figure out like how many how many travel days do I have in a week, how many workshop days, uh, how many other activities are you know must do activities, and then most other time than that is then spent um, between work and other activities. Yes, yeah, side cool. note to that, I definitely want to mention that Evan is going to be at two Schoolism workshops this year. It's going to be awesome. First one is coming oh, yeah. up June 3rd and 4th. You can see Evan live, learn from him live, watch him paint live in London, June 3rd and 4th. If you're lucky enough to get a ticket, that event is sold out. Uh, the other event that you can get on is October 14th and 15th, the Schoolism Copenhagen Workshop. That's happening October 14th and 15th. You'll see Evan there as well. You can go to schoolism.com and get tickets there. Um, I also And also I'll be I'll be in Berlin just to hang out. Oh, oh, right on. Awesome. Yeah. I didn't even know that. That's fantastic. So there you go. You never know who's going to show up at a schoolism uh, workshop. Um, again, big shout out to Evan and his Kickstarter campaign. You know, one of the best ways to really support an artist to buy stuff from him directly. You know, uh, Evan, your Kickstarter, I believe there's 50 days left, something like that. 51, 52, 53. Yep. 51. But uh, get on it early to get the good stuff. That's what I say. So oh, yeah. uh, help support Evan with his Kickstarter and get some awesome art at the same time. I uh, want to thank our audience for tuning in. Thank you for all the great questions. And, of course, my co-host, Matt Johnson. Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, yes, sir. number one thank you goes to my buddy, the amazing, the incredible, the super talented Evan Mulmunson. Thank you so much for hanging out. Cheers, man. It was a good time. Awesome. All right. Take care, everybody. And uh, the next stream is going to be with Schoolism instructor Jonathan Hardesty. That's going to be awesome, too. So stay tuned for that. Uh, sign up for the Schoolism mailing list to be in the know, to know what's going on. All right, everybody. Take care. This is Bobby Chu signing off. One of the greatest things about Schoolism subscriptions is that you can consistently keep learning at an affordable price. With Schoolism subscriptions, you can pay a monthly fee to subscribe to a course of your choice, and you can start learning right away. The other great thing is that it's affordable, so you can learn at your own pace. And if you're ever curious about another course, you can switch courses for just $1. Start your Schoolism subscription and start learning at schoolism.com. Thank <laughs> you.